And whenever you're ready, Mike, take it away. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. Um, I want to make sure I know how to make this thing work here. Do you get to explain? Is there? Yeah. Okay. And then the pointer is the black stuff. Ah, got it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, understand that uh, we are the last of the hospitals coming before you over the last couple of weeks. So last but not least. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have a little bit of a story to tell you. Uh, obviously, you've had a chance to see the slides beforehand, but we'll embellish those a little bit. Um, but first, I want to begin by um, thanking the Green Mountain Care Board for inviting us here uh, and uh, giving us the time to tell the story, and hopefully we can answer adequately any questions that you might have. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to express my appreciation to the staff of the hospital. Uh, who do a wonderful job day in and day out providing care to the Springfield community and to the patients that come to us. Uh, and to the folks in, on the hospital staff that helped Tom and I put this budget together for 2020. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a pretty conservative budget, we believe. Um, but it's a very realistic budget, we hope. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through it. Um, There we go. Uh, a little bit of background um, about Springfield Hospital. Um, it is a critical access hospital. Uh, it is um, one of two in the state that are associated with a federally qualified health clinic. Uh, as you know, the clinic actually uh, is operated uh, by the organization called Springfield Medical Care Systems, SMCS, um, and actually uh, the hospital is a wholly owned subsidiary of that parent, SMCS, that operates the FQHC. So um, that's the way we're structured. Um, our hospital has an average daily census of about 12 acute patients. Uh, sometimes it'll spike up to 17 or 18. It did that the other day. Um, as you can imagine, that is a real challenge for us um, to have enough uh, nursing staff to be able to handle those patients when they do spike up. Um, and, uh, but we do, and we do a great job. We have a number of uh, folks that are willing to be what we call on per diem, who will come in and uh, take those shifts, and they're very qualified people, uh, and then not work when the census goes down. So we average about 12. Um, we also have a uh, distinct 10-bed psychiatric unit. Uh, it's not on the campus in Springfield. It's down in Bellows Falls at the old Rockingham Hospital uh, that was converted to a 10-bed uh, psychiatric uh, uh, behavioral medicine program. Uh, it averages about seven patients a day. Uh, it can uh, go up to 10. That's our total capacity. As I said, it's a 10-bed distinct unit. Uh, there are days of the year that we are at 10, and we were there just recently. Uh, but most of the time, we average around seven to eight patients a day. Um, Springfield Hospital, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, and Springfield Medical Care, the, the parent of, of the hospital, uh, has uh, filed uh, Chapter 11 uh, with the uh, uh, bankruptcy courts, a Chapter 11 reorganization um, petition that occurred on June 26th. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a little while. Um, but even with the cost that you're going to, the cost cuts that you, you're going to see in this budget, um, and the um, uh, the other changes that we've done with operations, um, because of the uncertainty of those uh, activity levels uh, and the challenges that puts on the, on the staff, um, we don't believe that. The organization, as it is structured today, is sustainable, and and so we're and again you're going to hear a little bit more about this in a little while. Uh, the steps that we're trying to take uh, to see how we can uh, reorganize um, the the system, the organization, uh, to function a little differently. Um, from a financial point of view, uh, we have about 10 days cash on hand, uh, so we're living pretty much on the edge. 
Tom will talk about that a little bit further. Um, and as I said, we're, we're looking at um, trying to find a, a partner uh, in, in, uh, in our healthcare way we deliver healthcare in the, in the area and the um, uh, way that we could then restructure the organization. That's still being worked on as we speak. Uh, we have had several discussions with the Dartmouth Healthcare Organization and other potential partners. Um, and uh, we are currently in a state of where we are with those other organizations, uh, the other organizations being Mount Escutney Hospital and Valley Regional Hospital, um, along with Dartmouth. We're, we're looking at how we can structure those three hospitals along uh, and, and have Dartmouth as um, uh, a tertiary that would help support those three uh, rural hospitals, provide care in the, their respective communities in a collaborative way. Um, we actually, uh, the Dartmouth organization is funding some financial projections that are being done by a firm called BKD. Um, and we hope within the next two to three months to have those financial projections of how those three hospitals might be able to restructure, provide care to their communities in a more cost-effective and efficient way. Um, the uh, Chapter 11 process that I talked about a second ago, uh, it's a very fluid process. If you've ever been associated uh, with any organization that's been through that, um, Everyone tells us it will take anywhere from six to 12 months. The purpose for having done this strategy is uh, I think when we were here back in May, we talked about the fact that we can make the organization operate financially going forward, uh, but it's the debt that had been accumulated uh, it has to be dealt with and that's where the chapter 11 strategy process uh, helps us uh, deal with that. Uh, but it's moving slowly. Uh, the organization uh, is a very complex organization uh, because it is not only a hospital but an FQHC. There's a lot of, uh, and both organizations enter Chapter 11. Uh, there's a lot for the bankruptcy courts and the parties involved in that to understand how all of our organization works. And, um, and so it, it will be a slow moving process. Uh, we'll try to move along as quickly as we can from our perspective. Um, so the budget that you've, you've seen before you, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, in a few minutes here, uh, is one that's very much in transition. Um, uh, it, it does try to move us uh, in towards a restructured organization for the future, but it can anticipate all the changes that might occur as a result of those discussions that I've referred to. Um, it also does not and could not at the time that we put this together anticipate the cost of a Chapter 11 petition. Um, so none of those costs are included in this budget. So the budget is one that if we operated just as we did in the past, um, this, you know, we would have some ability to be able to say the probability of these numbers being close to accurate and, and actually um, incurred. Uh, the difficulty with us having to be able to do that now is because of the Chapter 11 and the restructuring process, it makes it very difficult to make those projections. Um, we did not ask for another rate increase. Um, several people have asked me, gee, why, why not? Um, Basically because we, we didn't do that because we, we are so heavily uh, used by the governmental payers, Medicare and Medicaid, about 65 to 70 percent of our payers um, are paid by either Medicare or Medicaid. And those payments are fixed payments, so a rate increase only drives up the contractuals for, uh, for that reason. And the other reason is the uh, board um, appropriately so, uh, granted our request for an increase uh, in the middle of the year. Um, many of the rate increases that we put in, um, the insurance companies didn't necessarily honor or said they would honor it 
when they do their normal rate increases, which is the 1st of October. So um, the 5% the increase, uh, we're not going to see some of that until October comes anyway. So that's why we did not ask for another rate increase. Um, so we'll get into the meat of the budget right now. Tom Marshall, who's the interim CFO, is going to handle several the next several slides for me uh, and explain some of the numbers that you see on there. So that the uh, <coughs> this is a picture of our operating uh, results in 2017, 2018, and our 2019 projected and going into the budget for 2020. Um, as, you, as you can see, revenues have stayed fairly flat uh, throughout the year from projected to, to the budget. Where we are making progress is in the operating expense line. We've reduced in, from $57.5 million down to $51.4 million in the, in the budget year. Um, the projected of 56.7, uh, I realize you all asked questions about how we were going to go from 56 million to 51 million in, in one year's time, but we've already started that process back in uh, the, in 2019, and we'll, we'll have some other slides that show that progress that we, we've already made to the expense reductions. Uh, adjusted emissions, as you can see, have affected revenues. Uh, we're in the 98, uh, 97, 9800, down to 8400 uh, in, um, in 2020. Average daily census has gone from 14.8 to 12 uh, this year, and in the budget, that's what we're using for uh, average patient days. Uh, the birthing center has been cl closed during 2019, so that, that's affected some of those numbers in, uh, in the census data. The psych census has uh, averaged, like uh, Mike said, around seven a day. Uh, we're budgeting 5.7 uh, within the budget year. Okay. If I can just add one point, when you look at the volume numbers, which is the adjusted admission line, um, it looks like we kind of fall off the cliff between 19 and 18, uh, when in fact, if you look at it on a quarterly basis, the decline in activities really started happening around July of 18 because of our fiscal year. Um, and, and so the fiscal year um, that ended in September of 18, only had one quarter of some declines that started occurring uh, around July, and then started that decline had continued on, and, and, and we believe um, that it's bottomed out, and, and that, that activity level um, will continue to run, and that'll be the new norm for us. That's what we anticipated in this budget, rather than those volumes coming back. We don't know the reasons for the decline, um, would be population health efforts. We hope that's probably what it is. Um, it could be some of the publicity that the hospital has been through over the last six months or eight months uh, in, in terms of what the public's image is of the hospital. Um, but we, we've seen that volume start to come back now, not at great numbers, but it's, it's not continuing to, to decline. Uh, so we, we're, we're talking about the, the revenue declines and, of course, the closure of labor and delivery. Uh, we had 152 deliveries in 2018. We were down to 66 in 2019 when, in May, we got closed the uh, labor and delivery department. Um, and gross revenues for labor and delivery in 2018 were $437,000. Uh, net uh, was 200,000. Uh, in 2019, we had a gross of 234,000, and net of 107,000. So uh, that that affected our top line mostly. Uh, inpatient census again is down 
from 16.2 in fiscal 18 down to really 11.9 to 12 in the budget. Uh, we also averaged about 12 in our projected uh, 2019 uh, figures. Uh, the site census has gone from 7.4 into the budget of 5.7. We've been running in this year uh, around seven in the psych center. Uh, again, outpatient volumes, as, as Mike said, uh, have come down quite a bit from uh, 449,000 tests and visits uh, in 2018 to 408 in the budget. In, uh, as of July, year to date, we had uh, 420,000 visits this year, projected to come in at 478,000 for the year. Um, but again, it's slowing down quite rapidly. Uh, a lot of uh, our ED, ED visits are down, and therefore all, a lot of procedures are down uh, on the outpatient basis. Um, we had um, operating uh, gross revenues in 2018 were $3.6 million, and uh, we had expenses um, I'm sorry, uh, that's, that's, oh, that's the site facility, was at $3.6 million in gross revenues. In the budget, will be down to $3.1 million. There are no uh, so there are no de departments left uh, on an operating basis that are losing money on the operating level uh, currently, and uh, with the changes in restructuring, uh, we still need a partner uh, to successfully emerge from the Chapter 11 process. As we, as we talked about um, our expense cuts. Let me, let me talk a little bit about those. We've, since um, Quorum has been involved in, in January, um, and, and for me as the interim CEO and, and uh, Wayne Schultz and now Tom, as the two interim CFOs have been here, we've. We have really focused our efforts over that period of time of trying to reduce our expenditures to match up better with our revenues and the cash that we're bringing into the organization. So what we try to do on this slide uh, is take a look at where we were in 2018, because those are the actual audited numbers instead of any projections that we were doing. And what are we saying the, those uh, expenses for the entire organization are going to be in 2020. Um, and then we gave you a list of some of the major factors. It was about $10 million reduction, uh, which is awfully uh, significant. Uh, but it's the only way uh, that we can try to stabilize the organization from a financial perspective. Uh, we've done these reductions uh, very deliberately, very consciously. Um, with a lot of discussion, uh, trying to minimize the impact on the care that we provided, trying to find ways that are items of expense that are more of an administrative point of view. Uh, but obviously, uh, we have had to touch some areas that are patient related. Um, the first one, as Tom had indicated, is um, back in May, we stopped delivering babies. Um, that saved the organization from an expense point of view, uh, about $860,000 from what we spent in 2018 to zero in 2020. Um, all of the changes that we did in the acute medical surgical side of things, uh, staffing changes, um, uh, restructuring the way we staff, um, our expenses we're predicting for the acute medical surgical side is what, uh, incorporating some of the reductions in volumes um, will be about $350,000. We believe on an annual basis less than it was in 2018. 
Um, there's employee benefits uh, of about $1.4 million that we're projecting less expense in 2020 than we had in 2018. Um, mainly focused around uh, our insurance program, our health insurance program. Um, we're doing what a lot of other organizations have done previously, and that is uh, uh, we're raising deductibles. Um, and uh, we're asking the employees to pay a little bit more for their premiums, um, along with some changes in the pension program that we're looking at making, as well as um, obviously the FICA with fewer uh, salary dollars. Uh, we have less FICA expense. The emergency department, uh, I think we talked about that when we were here back in May. Uh, we've changed emergency room providers, and we've changed the way in which um, we pay for that service. Um, we uh, accomplished, I think, the fact that we now have 24-hour uh, a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year, MD coverage in our emergency department. Uh, prior to that, um, we had some shifts that were covered by physician's assistants. Um, not that the care is any different, but um, it's proven that a physician um, can do a couple of things. One, he can see more patients per hour than a, a physician assistant can do. So our throughput is faster. Um, as, as well as, as Tom referred to earlier, uh, what we're seeing and experiencing is that uh, there are fewer ancillary tests ordered by those doctors um, that work for the new firm. Uh, and for example, the, the imaging uh, tests that they order, more of those are coming back positive. So there's less of uh, tests being ordered to rule things out. Um, and, and so the, the emergency room doctors who, who are all trained emergency room doctors uh, with this firm. Uh, just treat patients um, in a different way. And uh, uh, we've seen our throughput times go down, uh, turnaround times uh, uh, go down. Uh, and, and so it's been, I believe, beneficial for the patients as well as uh, taking $3.3 .3 million of expense out. Uh, it did reduce uh, revenues because the firm bills for that professional component. So our revenues went down as well, but it, it still took $3.3 .3 million of gross expenses out. Uh, the, hospitalist, the hospitalist program, we changed the staffing there um, to a different kind of a staffing model, uh, and that we believe will save us almost a million dollars a year. No difference in the, in the way we uh, cover the hours, just a difference in the way we, the, the number of of providers that we have uh, on at any given time. Uh, it's just more effective and efficient. Uh, we're proposing to change our anesthesia service. Um, uh, we are moving uh, from a hospital employed provider staff to a outside firm that will recruit nurse anesthetists and place those nurse anesthetists at our location. Uh, on a permanent basis, those folks will be there. Uh, that, we believe, will save us almost one, over a million dollars of uh, staffing and locum cost. Um, and then the final item, the key item there, is, is we're trying to do uh, our staffing without the heavy use of uh, locums, the heavy use of travelers. Um, locums in the ED alone in addition to the $3.3 million savings, uh, locums in the year 2018 cost the organization almost a half a million dollars. Uh, and we don't see the need to have to do that uh, for locums anymore because this outside firm uh, recruits the doctors and the physician assistants that are staffed in the ED. Um, and so the, the need to have to use locums um, is almost nil. So all of those items uh, make up the majority of the $10 million in expense savings that we have. Tom is now going to show you what some of that has done over the last couple of quarters. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a 2019 uh, fiscal year that uh, we're coming rapidly to a close on. Uh, for the first uh, six months of the of the year, we had the, uh, 
uh, gross revenues of uh, 60 million, then the, the next quarter, 24 million, and then for a year to date, June of uh, 84 million dollars. Uh, we're projected uh, July through September of 25 million and finishing up with a projection of 110 million, uh, 500,000 for the year. Now, uh, the real importance of, the, of this slide is to, is to look at our, our uh, operating uh, expenses. Uh, we've gone from uh, an annualized rate of 62 million in uh, the first six months. We started making our cost reductions uh, in uh, March and April um, of, of that year. Uh, and that, that quarter was we come in as an annualized $53 million. Um, and then, uh, so we're projecting the last quarter of the year, July through September, to be a, an annualized run rate of $49 million, uh, as opposed to our budget, which is $51 million um, next year. Now, part of the uh, reductions or all those items that uh, Mike had gone over, but we've uh, purposely are monitoring our expenses very closely. Uh, when, when we filed for bankruptcy on June 26th and prior to that, uh, we, were, we were doing weekly cash flow projections because as you saw, our cash was very tight. We were down to like two or three days at one point. Um, so we're really managing our expenses based on our cash inflow. And under the bankruptcy rules, we have to maintain uh, the payment schedule that we submit. We submit a 13-week uh, schedule every 13 weeks. It's updated, and uh, we have to live by those expense categories. So that helps us control our expenses. We've had to uh, redo how we order items, uh, and that's been a learning process with this, the department heads. Uh, at one point, a lot of the department heads could do their own ordering and order supplies and services, and now we've centralized all of that. We're building up our materials management department and putting the tighter controls because we've got to know each week what we actually need to spend. Now in bankruptcy, uh, of course, uh, we get relief from all, all our uh, credits, creditors uh, that were in place prior to the filing, but post-filing, we have to pay all our bills under the court orders, so we can incur anything more than we can actually pay. So we have, we have to have real tight controls on that, and it's been a, a learning process for our department judges and staff, but we're we're accomplishing the goals as as, as set forward, and, um, and and that's reflected in the budget for next year. That's why we are able to feel very confident that we could achieve those uh, expense goals within the budget for next year. And this is kind of, a, a, again, a summary of what I just <coughs> spoke about by quarter and how we're uh, coming down with the uh, expenses uh, under, under this new control system. You've uh, heard Tom and I now talk a lot about just the actual revenues and the expenses of the organization, but we wanted to take a look at and use some information that we had received from uh, One Care Vermont uh, back uh, for the period of January through March in terms of what the total cost of care was in comparison to other hospitals to see if there was opportunities to look at it. And um, you can see on this graph that we tried to do is just reflect uh, where Springfield Hospital ranked in terms of other hospitals in the state relative to some of those major categories of uh, lines of, of care. And the, the area that popped out was obviously our emergency room, um, both being uh, uh, two or more standard deviations of, uh, above uh, the mean. And, and so uh, we've done a few things in, in this next slide we wanted to share, just share with you a little bit about 
what we've done that we believe is going to have a major impact on that total cost of care uh, measurement. This slide just lists off uh, the bullet points that do that. Uh, the one I really want to take you down to is the second from the bottom. Uh, the biggest change we believe that will have uh, an impact on the total cost of care was what I referred to earlier, the change in the providers in the ED. Um, the new model that we have an MD 24 by 7. Uh, they're less likely uh, to admit, um, to have longer observation periods, um, they have a greater capacity to determine the level of care, on a very quick basis, um, and they appear to, to have a different, uh, we'll call it a, a more appropriate use uh, of imaging. Um, and, and what I referred to earlier was that the fact that a, on average a physician is not just our location, it's across the country, uh, on average can see one and a half patients an hour, uh, where uh, um, the average for a physician assistant is more like a half a patient an hour. Uh, they just move through the uh, care for the patient much, much quicker. So that was probably the, the, the major impact um, that we think is going to have on that total cost of care. Uh, if you go back up uh, to the top of that slide, uh, the second biggest one is back in uh, July of 19, just uh, a month ago. Uh, we brought on to the staff uh, a, a care coordinator. Uh, in the ED uh, for follow-up uh, with mental health and substance abuse um, issues and placement. Uh, so some of the things that that person does are the next several bullet points. Um, they, they, they're planning outreach by, by care, um, user uh, to develop more efficient and effective plan of care. Uh, they're providing on-site assessment for the intensive outpatient program that we have, which is basically a, a group therapy program. Uh, in collaboration with uh, the uh, designated agency that's there in Springfield. Um, the planning uh, implementation of, of rapid access to the um, medication assistant uh, therapy program. Uh, so all of those things that that uh, care coordinator in the ED now can do that we didn't have before, uh, we believe will have a, a major impact on the total cost of care. Uh, and then the last bullet uh, that we've uh, just uh, recently uh, instituted was an increase in the capacity of same-day uh, visits in our primary care practices, adding hours um, in Springfield, um, in Lundbury, uh, Ludlow, Charlestown, and Bellows uh, are now seven days a week. Um, six days a week is Londonderry, five days a week is in, in Springfield. So we believe that added capacity for those um, uh, walk-in type primary care services uh, will have a major impact on the uh, total cost of care also. One of the last things that we wanted to then uh, uh, address is uh, the issue of the payment reform and uh, the, the uh, One Care Vermont uh, organization. Uh, we. We and the FQAC has uh, participated uh, fully um, with all the payers uh, in the years 2018 and 2019. We're in that right now. Um, however, we believe that the challenges that we faced in 19 in getting some of the information on a timely basis um, puts us in a position that we believe, at least for the Medicare payer, um, that it the board felt it was not uh, fiduciarily responsible on their part uh, to take on the potential added risk of participating uh, in the uh, One Care program for Medicare. Uh, and that uh, being the hospital being paid uh, the traditional way uh, was more predictable for us, the, the downside risk was less for the organization. Um, and so for the year, 2020, um, and it'll be re-looked at uh, in a year from now, but in the year 2020, uh, the organization will only participate uh, in Medicaid and Blue Cross for the ACL in 2020. Uh, so in case you have any questions uh, concerning that. Then uh, just to summarize, if I can, um, uh, basically 
I think we talked about this before when we were here in May. Um, we're still uh, in, in late 2018 and early 2019. Uh, we were an organization that was pretty close to collapsing on a financial point of view. Um, it was very, very uh, minute by minute. Um, today, uh, we're an organization that's uh, in, a, in a state of transition. Uh, we believe we've been able to get our arms around the cost of the organization without materially um, decreasing the quality of care that we provide. We had the uh, CMS organization uh, through the Department of Health uh, visit us on July, I think it was 8th and 9th, shortly after we um, filed our petition in the bankruptcy courts. Um, they spent two very intense days at our organization. Um, what I've told people is they pr pretty much picked us up, shook us around, and, and looked at everything that we did. They actually um, gowned and went into the OR. Uh, and at the end of that visit, they said they were very impressed with the um, dedication that the staff had towards the patients, the energy level that they had, the enthusiasm that they had that they did not see in, in any area where uh, we were deficient in making sure that our care to our patients and the safety for our patients um, was, was being jeopardized. Um, so we are an organization in transition, financial transition. Um, we, we have begun to restructure our cost of providing care and continue to do that every, continue to do that every day. Um, we're always looking for ways that we can do things better uh, and cost us less. Um, we thank the state uh, for helping us uh, uh, with our cash crunch in the early part of 2019. Uh, we thank the board here for listening to us back in May and granting us a, a, a price increase. Um, and, and so uh, we continue to work on that. Uh, we have a we have trying to address the past debt by uh, doing a, a, a very uh, well thought out by the board decision to file um, a chapter 11 reorganization petition. Um, that's challenging for the organizations, it's challenging for the staff, it's challenging for the community to understand. Um, but we are open, uh, we are anxious to take care of patients who come to us. Uh, and we're trying to collaborate with hospitals like Brattleboro. Um, we are sending some of the, uh, their staff up, uh, their um, obstetric staff, uh, so that if it's convenient for uh, a woman who is pregnant to see their provider um, prenatal uh, type services, they can do that right there in Springfield uh, on our campus and have access to all of the ultrasounds and so forth that they might need. So we're trying to do those kinds of things while we do this debt restructuring. Um, and then finally, uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, with folks uh, from the Dartmouth organization, from Mount Escutney, from Valley Region, uh, trying to see how we can restructure uh, the way we provide care for those communities in a more cost-effective way of doing that. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, this is only going to work if our community supports us during this period of time. Um, our staff has been phenomenal. Uh, they have supported us um, all along. Um, there have been some staff that have left uh, because of the uncertainty of the organization's future. Uh, and I don't, I don't criticize them for that. I understand that. Um, but the staff that are there are very dedicated to Springfield Hospital, to the uh, Springfield Medical Care uh, Clinics. Um, into the community and the patients who come see it. So uh, with that, I, I just want to, I guess our recommendation would be that uh, the board would see fit to be able to approve our 2020 budget uh, as we've submitted it, and we're ready to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're going to start with Jess. Oh. <laughs> you don't want to forget me this time? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess my first question is, Given your financial situation that you came into, you obviously had no choice but to do a deep dive into your expenses, and it 
judging by what you've done, saving $10 million in one year, huge deep cuts and lots of thought that went into it, finding opportunities for cost savings. We just have budgetaries from a bunch of hospitals, many of whom are not in the same situation, but are facing negative margins and, and looking for opportunities for cost savings. I'm wondering if there are any lessons that you would share, places where other hospitals might look, things that surprised you when you walked into Springfield Hospital and saw this is the way they were doing it. Wow, here's, a, here's some low hanging fruit. What lessons could you impart? I'll, uh, I'll try to address that because I, I've got more tenure than Tom. Um, and I, I was there from the very technical term, the giddy up. <laughs> um, you know, it's difficult to answer your question. It's a great question, but it's difficult to answer it because every organization is different. Um, as, as Tom referred to earlier, and, and, I, and I try, I'm going to try not to be critical of the previous management, that uh, administrator and so forth, but um, the organization was, uh, as Tom referred to a little uh, while ago, uh, kind of loose in the way in which they ordered supplies and so forth. Everybody could order a supply, and if they found out that it might take two days to order, they were ordering it on Amazon. Um, and so we had to tighten that up. We had to try to get to a centralized purchasing arrangement. Um, so those are the kinds of things we did. Uh, we also, I mean, one of the big uh, pieces in the puzzle of, of the cost was looking at that service of childbirth. Um, that was a very difficult one, not one that every community can do. Um, but for us, um, it, it, it was a must. Uh, we didn't have a choice because we just couldn't find other areas that we could reduce cost uh, and continue to run that program. Um, it's only because we, we made that decision that we could change some of the staffing for our hospitalists and change some of the staffing in our anesthesia services uh, because now we do not have to have someone waiting uh, uh, in the wings all the time for any woman who would come in to the ED and have to deliver. Uh, and have to have a surgery, uh, 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 C-section. Um, so those those kinds of things. I, I think it's just, um, boy, it, it, you know, to try to generalize it, it it's just you, you. Not that other hospitals aren't doing it, and that's why I'm trying not to be critical because it's hard to. to I know I put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's hard to, to answer that because you don't know what other hospitals are doing. But for us, it was just tightening up. Uh, a lot of practices and, and uh, policies that we had, uh, things that we had to get our arms around and, and uh, not stock our shelves so much, uh, try to get people to see that uh, yeah, it, it may no take, it, yeah, no hoarding, as Sean said, you know, it, it may take uh, an extra four or five hours to get, so you don't need to stock up 12 of them. Right. Um, it's just some of the basic stuff that we had to do. Um, and, and then some of it was, you know, as you knew uh, before, we had to uh, ask people to give up some of their pay for some period of time. Um, you know, and, and some people have criticized us for having done that, but it gave us the opportunity for a short period of time to be able to have our expenses lower than what our revenue that we were bringing in, so we would buy ourselves the time to do some of these other things. Um, so I, I know I'm not answering your question, but. <laughs> Um, and, and the other, I guess my second question is related to that, you've also had to think about appropriateness of care, right? Balancing access to what is needed by your, in your community with can you cost effectively deliver it and you have enough volume to be able to produce the quality outcomes that you would want. And so I can imagine some of the, you know, you did some service line evaluation, right, to some degree. And the fact that you're, I'm encouraged to hear from Mount Scutney that the four hospitals, Dartmouth, Hitchcock, Valley Regional, Springfield, and Mount Scott, are getting together to think about some sort of regional planning in terms of service lines. And I'm wondering if there's anything you can speak to with respect to that. What criteria will you use to try and figure out who does what to ensure that access to care is not compromised, but it's, it's delivered in a cost-effective, high-quality way? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, there's, there's not going, there's going to be a little bit of science in it. Um, I've been involved in these kinds of situations before where hospitals have tried to get together. Um, there's a lot of just gut feel. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is um, uh, there'll be 
hospitals that will do a particular line of business better. And, and when you take a look at some of the measurements or some of the capabilities of doing it. Uh, for example, if I can get specific, we've got two very uh, highly qualified urologists. For a hospital our size to have two urologists, uh, you know, it, it's marvelous. And, and, and so, you know, but when I sit down with the other three CEOs in Dartmouth, I'll be pushing that if we're going to start looking at centers of excellence between those three hospitals, that urology should be on the table for Springfield to maintain or find a way to do that. Because what we don't want to do is do something that will scare those two urologists away and that uncertainty, because uh, they're being recruited, like every other physician specialty is being recruited on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. And so we've got to be careful about you know, how we move forward. Um, so there'll be a little bit of that kind of discussion that, you know, you know where do those patients come from, which organization would be best to have it. Um, but the whole idea would be let's not try to triplicate what we're doing because that's not very cost effective. And it begins to challenge the quality because you can't assure yourself that if you need two specialists to do that particular service, uh, you're going to be able to get six of them to come to this area. You can get two, but you may not be able to get six. I think we're all looking forward to the results of all of those conversations. Um, can you turn to the top total cost of care slide? I think it was 10. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That one? Yeah, that one. That'd be great. So first of all, I want to say I appreciate the efforts that you're making to lower total cost of care, to think about these initiatives. You know, you've got several initiatives to address the total cost of care in your community, particularly in light of the financial situation that you've been under, that you're still finding time to think about ways to address this. Uh, a couple of things. The slide, I think, I, don't, I wonder if you could redo it for us, because and unless I'm misunderstanding this, the orange is reflects being one to two standard deviations either above or below. Yeah. There's a big difference. You're almost two standard deviations above and almost two standard deviations below. There's a big difference in there, mm -hmm. but they're all colored the same way on mm here. -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could resubmit this with another way of looking at it. So we can tell where are you above the average and where are you below the average. Sure. And you can have darker colors if you're way above the average and a slightly lighter shade if you're slightly above the average. But you see what I'm saying? Yes, def definitely. We use this, um, the initial time we used this, this was more directional, and that's why we did it this way. Okay. It, the directional, we wanted to really hone in on the, what we thought to be the greatest opportunity for success. Right. Um, and Appreciate not get scattered that. in too many different places. Right. And I, I just I bring that up because in the, uh, the data that we submitted in our guidance, the total cost of care for the Springfield <coughs> HSA, actually not risk adjust adjusted, but Springfield is the second highest on that chart in our budget guidance. Um, in the blueprint profiles, it's also second highest in the state, and that is risk adjusted. And it was the third highest in resource use. So when you look through some of the, blu the blueprint profile uh, individual data, advanced imaging was really high, as you mentioned, and I'm really glad that you've got a methodology that's trying to address some of that. Uh, but screening rates, chronic disease management were low, inpatient use was high, admissions were conditions that could have been prevented by early intervention, primary care were high. So to me, it almost suggested that there wasn't enough primary care in the community for some of the conditions that we're seeing not being addressed, not being managed, not being screened for. Mm -hmm. So I'm also really happy to see that you're increasing capacity for uh, primary care in your community. But I'm still love that data is a little out, you know, out of date in the sense that it's 2017, and uh, that's what the blueprint profiles have now. So it'd be, it'd be helpful for us to see this is one care data, much more recent, but color coded in a more specific way. Okay. That'd be helpful. Um, a question about your beds. So we always hear in all of our hospital budget process the number of borders for psych patients and, and ERs, the lack of capacity for psych beds. You have 10 psych beds. Yes. And my question to you is, it's, it's been, average occupancy has been about seven. I would have thought it would be closer to 10 given what we have in the state of need for psych beds. But I'm even more surprised that in the budget for 2020, it's dropping to 5.7. So can you just tell me, I'm just, this, to me there's a disconnect between the obvious need in the state for psych beds and the dropping 
and projected capacity or utilization there? I think the only connection that we can really draw is um, we are limited to being voluntary admissions through that site unit. And so we can't. And those are all step down, right? Uh, that I don't know, Kim. I don't want to say yes, I believe it is, but. but uh, well, they're definitely not inpatient acute site beds. Right. No, no, no. But, sure. but some, of the, some of the, I thought some of the pipeline issue was there weren't enough step down. To, or people were having trouble placing people when they're ready to leave hospitals. There aren't enough placement mm -hmm. places, particularly for geriatric. And, so I guess I'm just trying to understand. The other thing is, the second reason is, is that, that we're trying to approach this on a very conservative basis. We're, we're trying to uh, underestimate and overperform. And so, uh, you know, we've watched our census go down a little bit. And, and again, don't know why, why that doesn't jive better with what appears to be a demand in the state, other than the fact that we are solely voluntary mission <laughs> status uh, with the state. Um, but we try to be conservative and, and project that census. We can beat that census. Um, and there's not a lot of additional staff we need to have to have nine or 10 patients versus seven or eight. Okay. So it's a, yeah. it's a big plus to us if we can have it another works. one or two patients a day. And that was one of the operations that was actually you know, breaking even or, or actually contributing to a margin, right? It was, yes. yeah. And my final question that I've been asking all the hospitals to get a sense of relative pricing. So a service that's reimbursed by Medicare, $100 at Springfield, what would the same service be reimbursed on average by your commercial payers? Uh, I'll let Tom answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understand the question, actually. So a service that's being provided, a Medicare patient comes in, it's reimbursed at $100. Yes. That yeah. very same service, a commercial payer comes in, what would that reimbursement be on average, given that's a commercial payment. Same service, different payer. Um, you can get back to me if you need to. Yeah. I think, I think what you're asking is we, we were looking at this before we came over here today and <coughs> what the difference for Medicare charge versus what we're getting paid on average. And I uh, believe that was somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 percent? Yeah. So we get 42 cents for every dollar that we charge a Medicare patient. We get 42 cents in reimbursement. So I think what you're saying is it would almost have to be a dollar 42 for the commercial payer in order to cover the shortfall that we're not getting from Medicare if our charges were equal to our cost. But that's not going to be the case either. So. No. <laughs> So well, you want to, we'll have to get back yeah, to you on um, that'd be fine. Yep. specific answer. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay, Maureen. Uh, thank you for the presentation. A um, few questions um, are somewhat related to the bankruptcy, but I know, you know, as you've gone through this process, you need to pay everybody now going forward. Right. Um, However, have you had any issues with, you know, suppliers or continuity of supply for people maybe who weren't getting paid for some of the stuff that was in the past that now you expect to partner with in the future? Um, are you having you know, concerns with any oh. vendors or suppliers? Many. <laughs> it, 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 it initially, uh, almost day one, it's been a, a constant uh, negotiation with a lot of our key vendors to uh, assure them that uh, even though um, what we owe them in the past is now put into the bankruptcy protection, that we have to pay them going forward and will pay them going forward. So it's been, uh, I've been on a lot of conversations with CEOs of the companies that, are, that represent the vendors and. Uh, and we, we could pull, uh, we could force vendors to supply to us through the courts, but that's a very expensive and time-consuming process. It's better if we can negotiate, uh, even if a lot of times we wind up negotiating, we prepay for services, and now we're starting to get to the point where we can maybe get a net 10 days to pay, and. Eventually, we hope we can get back to a reasonable net 15 or net 30 payment plan with our key vendors. Okay, so some of it's prepaying. Are, are you seeing 
any vendors or because you have to change suppliers, costs going up? No, no. We haven't had to change suppliers yet. Well, one is the uh, linen. Oh, well. Linen, the, the linen yeah. provider went bankrupt on their own and we went from a laundry <coughs> service to immediately and we're now going into a linen rental program and it's going to cost us twice as much to do that program but we were at a position in the, in the area that uh, there was no alternative clean laundry uh, went out of business so we're servicing a lot of hospitals uh, and going back to your financial results, your the trending page you have, uh -huh. um, a couple questions on that. One, in 19, where your operating income is the negative 6.5, um, you know, in your most recent financials, you have a little over $8 million in, in other operating revenue, although of course it's not revenue, it's a loss, uh, getting to $15 million, not yeah. the loss. Did, Anything move in 19 from what would have been an expense category to those areas? And in 20, what's your projection? Because you have zero there for other operating. So it's not on this slide. It's, on oh. your, it's your non-operating oh, revenue. Oh, the transfers between. between yeah, so, it's so can you talk yeah, a little bit? Those are costs that, we, uh, that are part of SMCS and that the hospital, we have cross expenditures for example our health benefit program is all paid by the hospital and um, on a cash basis and uh, the, the cost the cost of that is transferred over on the books to SMCS for, for those and we have staff that's on SMCS's books that's transferred over to the hospital so we have a lot of cross pollination going on and th that line over the years it was uh, detrimental to the hospital but positive to SMCS when uh, we had those kind of services. I guess as a follow-up so in, in 19 it's a negative 8.6 million right and in 20 you have it as zero and just want to yeah we're moving to a, to a, where SMCS has to stand on its own as well as the hospital will be standing on its own. That's going to be forced to us through the bankruptcy process. Okay. So we're, we're planning on that going forward. So that was another question. So as far as the FQHC, you're not subsidizing the FQHC in the 2020 budget? Correct. Okay. Um, you started off talking a little bit about there was some conservatism in the forecast. Um, it always worries me a little bit, especially with this, the history with Springfield. But when you look <laughs> at um, the 11 million, if you look at the projected July through September of your net, net patient revenue, um, it's 11 million in the last quarter. And your projected 19 is 49 million, and your, your projected 20 is 49 million. Um, but most of that trend had occurred in the first six months of the year. So just want to talk about how comfortable you are that that's going to increase each quarter to get you to a run rate of 48 million um, for 2020. Because obviously you've cut some services, things have changed, and that's part of the reason why you're coming down. So I see you know, you had 9 million in, the, in your third quarter, you're projecting 11 for the fourth, but you know, the first two quarters you're running more at like 14 million each. We've had a, a number of uh, adjusting entries that we've had to record in contractual adjustments that are catch-up entries even from back in 2018 that the current books, uh, we, we've brought in some of our uh, quorum experts on reimbursement and, and uh, <coughs> issues and, uh, you know, uh, the PIP program with one care, et cetera, we've had to make a lot of adjustments to our contractuals, so that the net revenue numbers historically right now are now being trued up. We expect in 2020 that we'll have that all in, in enough shape that we, we feel confident in the 
our net revenue numbers going forward. I thought some of that had a lot of touch up entries. I thought some of that contractual change actually was a favorable change. No. We had a two million dollar negative. Okay. Adjustment. And where did that book through? In uh, the month of May. The month of May. So that would have been eleven for that quarter, and then it's eleven now. I'm just, I'm just yeah. saying, to get to forty nine million, you have to get that that trend going up right. each quarter. And but that stabilized what we feel is our going forward contractual that we baked into the budget going forward. So, and it, it's not a true run rate to just to take that one quarter. Um, okay. It's just, it, you know, in the past, the expense load, you kind of have that as a base that's harder to change. And if you ended up only coming in at $44 million, that would be a challenge. And I know sure. we, you'll be watching it every day as you need to. Yeah. Um, and then you talked a little bit about why you didn't do a commercial rate increase. Um, and I would just question, you know, whether or not, you know, if, if in fact, and you're saying it didn't really go through potentially when, we, when you did the secondary one this year, because then if it did, if some of it did go through in May, you wouldn't be seeing a new increase until, you know, a year plus later. So not saying the board would approve it, but obviously you're in a lot of financial difficulty. And if there were a commercial rate that was trying to put forward, you know, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, it, it was it was more the fact that um, the, the amount of dollars that ends up falling to the net revenue line from a rate increase um, for us is just not, you know, it's not significant enough to be continuing to raise our prices. I'm concerned that we're going to get to a point for the folks who are price shopping that the prices are just going to get you know, to a point where they're going to choose to go elsewhere because our prices are so high. They don't understand the concept that okay. we've got. And so that was, it was more mm -hmm. of a price market sensitivity issue. Right. And you're about 45% is where your revenue comes in commercial. So you're, you're not on the lowest, but you're on the lower side yeah. of reimbursement. But, you know, it'd be good if some of the other hospitals felt the same way about that. But I understand what you're saying. Um, commercial gets fairly high. Um, that's all I have. Thanks. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, sticking with the uh, payer mix here for a second. So I'm, I'm looking at your history um, from 2016 to 2018 uh, that the Medicaid was uh, between 13.6% or 14.4% of your NPR commercial 53.3% to 56.2%, and Medicare 29.8% to 33%. And now uh, the most recent is for 2019 projected, and uh, Medicaid is up to 18%. Commercial, as just noted, is around 45%, and Medicare is um, uh, <clears throat> at 35%. So I'm kind of looking at that and then thinking about this morning's conversation about the capacity that exists within 20 miles of, of Mount of Scutney and Springfield and, and, and the hospitals in um, New Hampshire. And I'm just wondering, as you hope that things are bottoming out here and making a turn uh, and meeting with people that might be potential partners, what are the two or three <coughs> positives, reactions, that you get from those folks that uh, inspire you to that, that there is a light at the end of this tunnel? Um, not sure if I know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel or not. Um, um, I, I think you know, the, the kernel that I'm getting is the willingness for, for us to talk pretty frankly around the table um, and to talk about the fact that uh, we've got to look at trying not to duplicate and triplicate what each of us are doing. That's not going to be the success in the future. 
but we also recognize that uh, we today each have our own boards and our, and our own balance sheets that we have to worry about. Um, and, and so I think there's only one single kernel, if I understand your question, I think there's only one single kernel that keeps me optimistic is that, that uh, Dr. Paris, uh, Dina Howard, um, Steve LeBlanc and myself are willing to have these kinds of conversations and pretty frank and, and open conversations and we're not trying to hide behind. Well, I can't, I can't even think about talking about that because that's kind of like a sacred cow. We gotta have that in this community. We're, we're, we're not approaching any of that in that fashion. We're approaching any, you know, how do we best do this amongst the three hospitals with darkness supporting us. Uh, if those conversations start going sideways on me, I'm going to lose that optimism. And uh, my other question was just looking at the, uh, trying to get totally acclimated to the math here associated with healthcare provider tax. And so I'm looking at from 2018 to 2020, um, the total operating expenses um, at 83% of what they were in 2018. Uh, but the provider tax is at four and a half percent, at a hundred and four and a half percent. So, provider tax still going up, and your operating expenses going down. And um, is 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 that what should be happening? Um, as I understand it, the provider tax is a percentage of net revenue, not so much your expenses. So, yes. and your net revenue is going down. Uh, um, Hello. It, it is, but uh, I don't think they base it on the budget. I think they, they're basing it on historical numbers, so it's going to take a little while for that to catch up to that calculation, as I understand it. Okay. okay. Robin. Thank you. Um, most of my questions have been asked, so I just have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, in your narrative, um, you indicated you weren't expecting any additional pay health reform payments, and I'm assuming that's because the population health payments from the ACO go to the F2HC, so those will be booked separately, is that? That's correct, that's, that, that gets reported on the SMCS records. Thank you. Um, and you, you had said that you, understandably had not included the cost of the bankruptcy proceeding in your budget. Can you just give us a sense of magnitude in terms of what that might look like? We've, we've been told to plan on somewhere in the magnitude of about 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's legal fees yeah. and professional services. Okay. And, and the trustee costs. Court costs. And, and that's if we can get out within six to 12 months. If it goes on longer than 12 months, and that number is going to keep getting larger and larger. Thank you. Um, I think that's actually all I have. So, Mike and Tom, are you two committed to staying through the restructuring? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I can say I am. Um, Tom has had some personal things that, that have come up in the last week or two that we will probably have to make a change at that CFO level. Uh, we do have a- That's gotta be hard on you because this will be number three. Um, Sorry, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm chasing him away. <laughs> but um, I hope I'm not. Uh, it, yes, but uh, on the other hand, um, th these are, uh, very, very talented CFOs, and it doesn't take them long. It's probably more difficult on the accounting staff um, and the training that they have to take time out to do to train <laughs> a new person coming out, and, and so much difficult on them. But um, they're, they're very talented executives. You know, we're very fortunate. Um, this is going to sound like a commercial, but, and so maybe it is. Uh, you know, I've been around Quorum a long time. Uh, we have a lot of very talented executives that want to work for Quorum. Um, and uh, 
So I'm, I'm very confident that I, I don't, we already have somebody lined up, very experienced, knowledgeable, knows what the situation is, um, and we're working on a transition timetable right now. So, but I'm, I'm committed, uh, you know, God willing, and I say God willing, and the creek don't rise, um, I'll be here. Perfect. You talked about um, expansion of the uh, primary care practices, and yet last year you lost money in the primary care practices. Is the expansion a result of better knowledge of when people would actually access the care? Or how did you come to the conclusion to expand in, in something that was losing money? Are you referring to the, the walk-in clinics? Or? Yep. Um, primarily from the standpoint that, that that's what we believe the customer really wanted. Um, and um, we're going to try to see if that's what they wanted by making sure that they show up. If, they, if it turns out after several months that we're not as busy as we thought we were going to be, then we'll have to pull those that, that uh, you know, staffing back. But at this point, um, it, it's a contracted service. Uh, it's not a hired service, so we can get out of that relatively quickly. So help me understand, because I know that technically we're focused on the hospital side here. Um, the hospital was fully owned by the FQHC. The bank allowed for separate filings of the two entities. So what does it mean for the hospital if the FQHC continues to lose money? Um. It will have almost an impossible task of coming out of Chapter 11 if it continues to lose money. It's going to have to show an exit plan. That exit plan is going to have to show that it can stand on its own financially. Um, now, Could a possible resu result of the bankruptcy court be, though, a split up of the entity? Um, it, it, it could be, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's going to be more of this uh, of the, the issue that's going to play into that more is going to be this regional planning that we're working on because because the you know no one can own that FQHC. Um, I think I've given my general counsel coronary, so I better stop <laughs> the <line of> question. <laughs> Does the uh, estimate that you gave us earlier in, include the um, creditors? I'm sorry. Mr. You Chairman. gave us an estimate of the cost of the, the bankruptcy proceeding. Oh no, no. that's not no. that's not the settlement of the creditors. That's just the attorneys and professional fees for the court itself, itself, the court itself, and so forth. Okay. Yeah, that, that's we we haven't gotten to the point. And we're a little ways away from figuring out the settlement for the credit and what that the amount of debt that the organization will have to continue to carry as a result of that. And I'm assuming much to my chagrin the, the attorneys get paid first. Oh yes. That's what I thought. But but the court really has <laughs> got tight controls on that. The court decides what what the attorneys will be paid. Okay. I guess that's all the questions I had at this so time. I have a from your questions uh, around the primary care, I would assume that if if part of what's going on is you expand hours, people stay locally instead of perhaps going to primary care someplace else. Not only does that help the FQHC, but it could also help some of your ancillary services and referrals back to the hospital. Is that a fair assumption? That's what we're using as <laughs> part of our logic behind doing it. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure my logic was matching. Thanks. Okay, at this point, we're going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, looking at your bad debt and free care members, um, I recognize that you're small, and so um, you know, a, a percent of bad debt as compared to your patient revenue uh, that looks um, high or exceedingly high to us. Um, 
uh, it might be related to a few small, a few cases. That, um, I, I guess that's really my question. Your your numbers uh, uh, for 2018, uh, you're showing 11 percent of uh, your net. Your bad debt is 11 percent of your net patient revenue. Your that's uh, that's significantly higher than than the other hospitals in Vermont. Do you have any idea what's going on? Um, I think it's probably a combination of a couple of things. One is, um, and I don't know this for fact, so I can be, I can be argued against or, or corrected, but um, since I've been there, I've been told that, that the economy of our service area is one of the poorest in the state. Um, and so I think we have a number of people um, who either can't qualify for any kind of the free care uh, programs and then just choose not to pay. Um, the other thing that, that we've been working on is trying to tighten up our whole collection, our hospital collection efforts before it goes off to a collection agency. Um, because once it goes off to a collection agency, it's basically written off as bad debt and if there's any recovery, it's offset. So if we can improve our services, we can reduce the amount of money that we have to send to, to that debt. Okay. Um, any other comments or just generally, when we look at your 2018 numbers, uh, uh, your public payer versus private payer, um, you don't look, you, you actually look like you're in better shape than many of the hospitals. Um, and that's confusing to me that, that for 2018, as some other people have said some of these numbers similarly, you're showing 45% of your net patient revenue is from the public payer, um, and 54% from the commercial payers. And, um, I, you know, I, I see you sort of shaking your head that, again, we're comparing you to the other hospitals. Um, it just sort of leads me to the question, um, well, actually, it leads me to the question. Um, a moment ago, you said you didn't ask for a rate increase because of uh, how little impact it has. Um, and yet, all the other hospitals have come in and ask for a rate increase. Um, even with smaller percentages of their net patient revenue coming from uh, commercial payers. But, but I'm, I'm wondering if those other hospitals, had they gotten a, a mid-year this past year, would have also asked for another one. If they didn't get one yeah. 12 months ago, you know, yeah. we would be, I mean, we would be also asking for but since we just got one. That's okay. That, that doesn't make you different from everyone else. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. This is my question. Okay, so at this time I'm going to open it up to the public for any comments about the Springfield budget. Dale. I didn't see anything in documentation, and I realize this may not be totally relevant, maybe to the type of presentation this was, but considering they're in Chapter 11, wouldn't there be a concern about serving the community from a qualitative, quantitative perspective to see how they are responding to what is happening with the hospital? Because they're the ones that are gonna to have to support this hospital in order for it to be successful. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, did I miss something? Where's that something that tells me how the community is responding to this? Well, I think that, uh, and Mike may want to say some more on this, but he's had a number of uh, town hall type meetings with the community trying to explain the situation. What, what you're bringing up was my concern from the beginning that um, the community itself needs to get more involved if they truly want to save their hospital. And that's been a concern of mine from the get-go. But Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything. Sure, I can, I can add that we have had several rounds. And, and um, Josh uh, Dufresne, who's in the audience and, and um, is very, very involved in the community and involved uh, at the hospital and with the clinic. Uh, has been joining me on these town hall meetings uh, where we're uh, 
trying to get the feedback from the community as to how they're feeling. Um, initially, those were very well attended. Uh, the last round, there wasn't as many people attending. Um, so we're not reaching out to as many people as, as we would hope to. Um, the other thing that we did is every three years we have to do a community needs assessment. And we're just completing ours now. Uh, and as a part of that, there are focus groups um, as a part of that process. And we're using that opportunity so that we're not over flooding people with town hall meetings or surveys or anything like that. We use that process of uh, meeting with the people during the community health needs assessment to get some kind of reaction as to how they're feeling about their community hospital, just in general, in addition to the community needs that we're doing. Okay, is there other public comment? Jeff. Um, yeah, I'm Jeff Keeman with the Hospital Association. Just a few quick thank yous as we conclude. Um, first, thanks to the powers that be that these hearings are over. Um, <laughs> and um, really importantly, thanks to Mike Halstead and Josh Dufresne and the team at Springfield for really um, amazing efforts to, to begin to stabilize a really struggling uh, hospital that's critical to care in, in Vermont. And then last, thanks to the board um, for a couple things. Thank you for the opportunity to address you at the beginning of these hearings with, with sort of the perspective of the Hospital Association. We really appreciate that opportunity. And thank you as well for your thoughtful questions. This is not an easy process, and the outcome is really important, and you took it seriously and always do, and we thank you for that. Um, and then finally, thank you for the good judgment you're about to use in um, reaching the right conclusions. Thanks. We'll see you in two weeks if you still say that. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. You have more over here. Oh, here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, did you ask uh, the hospital if they do radical prostatectomies? <laughs> so, Mike. Nope. <laughs> the question from Mr. Davis is Do you do radical prostatectomies? I don't have a clue, but I'm, I'm looking at my <laughs> chief medical officer back there. We have the capability. I don't know that they're done that spring We have your office that works at Dartmouth as well. So it depends on the case, and I'm not exactly sure what exact procedure she's doing as for the break now. Is there any other public comment? Seeing none, I wish to uh, thank the team from Springfield. I know it's been some trying times, a lot of hours put in trying to save uh, the hospital. And uh, I know this board appreciates all the work that you're doing to try to keep services available for people in the Springfield community, so thank you.